above all we could ask or think. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory to God. Um, what was so much in my spirit was um, the Lord challenged me that he is looking, his eyes are looking to and fro in the body of Christ for a glorious church, for a glorious church. Hallelujah. God wants a glorious church full of believers who walk by faith and are full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And who understand how to live in the glory of God. Joshua 1.9, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 6 to 14, 2 Chronicles 5, 6 to 14, the word says, also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him before the ark were sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. Then the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place, into the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place, under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. The poles extended so that the ends of the, of the poles of the ark could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside, and they are there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they had come out of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priest came out of the most holy place for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. And the Levites who were the singers, all those of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments and harps, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, hallelujah, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I love that last part. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord was filled with the cloud. Hallelujah. The glory cloud. Some people call it Shekinah glory so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Hallelujah. I love the word, and, and uh, as I was studying out this word, the Holy Spirit challenged me. He was like, I'm looking for a glorious church. I'm looking for my people to carry the glory in such a realm, in such a depth that I has not seen and ear has not heard, to move in glory in such a way that there will be miracles, signs, and wonders happening all the time. You know, that there will be such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit just really laid it in my heart. I've been praying over this uh, word and, and just over this for, for the last few days, just before the Lord as he gave this into my spirit. And... Um, I want to encourage us all to seek after the Lord and to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us to overflow. Hallelujah. So that we can perform uh, uh, great exploits. So we can be everything God has designed and destined us to be before the foundation of the world. He says, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. That's another thing the Lord's been, been just speaking again and again in my spirit. I knew you before you were even in your mother's womb. So why do you limit me? You know, why do you limit me? No limits. 
no limits. I can do anything as long as you keep the faith and trust me and move in my glory. I can do anything. And I was like, okay, Lord. So praise God. I want to encourage you with that. In him, I am in the glory by grace. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In him, I'm in the glory by his grace. Through Christ, I have access to the glory. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and I believe that I have access beyond the veil. And we heard that from our apostle. We don't need a feeling. We just need faith. Amen? It's not about feelings. It's about faith. Glory to God. And according to um, our apostle and his message, Operating in the Glory, he states that we're going from glory to glory. The Spirit of God is the administrator of revelation. He helps us to see the invisible. That revelation of God's splendor by grace through faith. Jesus paid the price and qualified us. He paid the price and he qualified us. So we're qualified to carry the glory. We're qualified to move in the spirit and by the spirit. Not just the gifts of the spirit, but the fruit of the spirit. Not just the fruit of the spirit, but the movement of the spirit. The revival of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. As God's children, we have access. We're carriers of the glory. And um, the requirements for carrying glory is walking in honor, wisdom, and faith as worshipers and kingdom ambassadors. Amen. Walking in honor, wisdom, and faith as worshipers, glory to God, and kingdom ambassadors. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I want to encourage us as we are chasing after God and, and, and seeking him and just letting him uh, take us from glory to glory, that as we do so, we let him transform us, that we stay in his presence long enough, that we bask in his presence long enough to be changed, to be totally changed. So when people look on us, they don't see us. Hallelujah. <laughs> they see Jesus. Amen. They see Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We activate that glory by faith. Hallelujah. We activate his glory by faith. God makes his servants catalysts that carry his glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're a catalyst. Amen. We're catalysts in the spirit. Hallelujah. We're catalysts for the kingdom as ambassadors in the kingdom, as his servants and especially in the fivefold ministry, if you're called uh, in any aspect of ministry, especially in the fivefold, you are carriers of the glory. You are catalysts of the glory. That means you will in, in, enact a miracle because when you are placed in a chemical reaction, there's going to, I'm taking a little leaf from what Apostle preached in Swaziland, so powerful. Oh, Lord. Hey. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he was talking about how we are a catalyst of the glory of God. And when we understand who we are and who God has made us to be in him, we can make a chemical reaction in the realm of the spirit to bring a move of God that eye has not seen and ear has not heard. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. So let God's glory fill this house. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let his glory fill this house. Fill us individually and corporately. Amen. Because as we do so, he will fill the entire house. He'll fill the entire body of Christ. Hallelujah. With his glory. And there will be an, an outpouring of the spirit of God. And souls will be saved in multitudes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They'll be saved in multitudes. Glory to God. Glory to God. They'll be saved in multitudes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because they'll see Jesus. They won't see any normal person. <laughs> they'll see Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They'll see Christ in us. Hallelujah. And they'll run to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when the scales fall from their eyes, they will see him as he is. And they'll be wanting to be saved and delivered and set free and honoring God and living for God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I just, it's so, so much in my spirit. I've just been praying over this, that the Lord will do a work in us all. Hallelujah. That he'll transform us 
in such a way that the, the, the miracles will be normal. And the Bible talks about it, as we read in Second Chronicles uh, chapter 5, that the cherubim will cover the poles. And the Lord began to challenge me and give, give me revelation of that, that the poles are just the natural things, but that the angels will cover the natural. Hallelujah. The angels of the Lord will cover the natural and will perform the supernatural. Whether it's financial breakthrough, it'll happen. Hallelujah. Whether it's miracles, signs, and wonders, it will happen. Hallelujah. Whether it's a breakthrough in someone's mindset, it will happen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Breakthroughs in business, it will happen. Breakthroughs in career, marketplace, it will happen. Because there's a glory that will supersede what is. Hallelujah. In the natural. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. May that be our portion as we walk this out. God bless you tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Before we conclude tonight, we are going to be praying for the team that will be doing the hashtag, I pray for you. That's going out tomorrow, we're really looking forward to that. And I'm excited about it. And um, I believe that the Lord is um, filling us up, fueling us, amen, for for that and for other things. Um, I want to share tonight about uh, something that I believe is very, very important in our relationship with God and in accessing the deeper things and the deeper relationship with God um, and how God can take our lives to another level. I want to talk about dealing with the orphan spirit. Dealing with the orphan spirit. Luke chapter 3, verse 38. Luke chapter 3, verse 38. You can talk about overcoming the orphan spirit, same thing. Um, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. The son of Adam, the son of God. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting upon him. And a voice. Next verse, 17. Like, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Help me tonight. It's amazing to me that of all the things that the Father could have said at this momentous moment, when Jesus is about to be launched into his ministry as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world, that this is what the Father says. He could have said, this is the deliverer of the world. He could have said, this is the Savior of the world. He could have said, this is the healer of the nations. He could have said, this is the King of the kingdom of God. He could have said so many things but he says, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. That's the biggest thing that God could have said. He said, this is my son. We found out and read earlier that Adam, at one point, in fact, not at one point, he always had, was, 
was the son of God. <laughs> Adam was the son of God. You go back into genealogy and everybody's begotten by so-and-so, someone's begotten by so-and-so, and forget to Adam, and then Adam is the son of God. Isn't that amazing? God was Adam's father in every way. God was Adam's father. Now, why is this so important? Now, the fall of man is important because the fall of man meant the alienation of Adam and Eve from their father. Got that? And who's their father? God. Adam's father was God. <laughs> it came from God. I'm just pausing for you to digest that because it's, it's very key. So when sin came, that made Adam and Eve orphans. Not because God had died, because that's normally how an orphan comes to become an orphan, it's because the parents die. No, he didn't become an orphan because the fa God died. It's because Adam and Eve died to God. And they became orphans, fatherless. Fatherless, without parents. So Jesus came to reconcile us back to God, not only legally and spiritually, but relationally. Can you say relationally? He came to restore us to a vital relationship with God the Father. God the Father. So we read in Romans chapter 5 verse 10. For if, when Romans chapter 5, verse 10, we give them give, um, a second to, to just put that up. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, reconciled, brought back to God, through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, shall we shall be saved by his Life. Can I hear you? Amen. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse eighteen and nineteen. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse eighteen and nineteen. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ. Someone say, "I am reconciled to God." Okay. So the Bible talks about as past tense. So all things are of God or from God or God is the initiator and the origin of all things. He is behind this and has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So uh, every believer has a ministry called the ministry of reconciliation which means and it says now let's just go to verse 19 that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation now, this is a lot right here, but let me just unpack it real quick and then we'll go to verse 20. So here is the message of reconciliation. That God the Father was in Christ. Got that? On the cross. So the God was in Christ and he was reconciling, bringing the world back to relationship to himself not counting their sins any longer. Now, this is very deep. This is very deep because what this is saying 
As far as God is concerned, He is not counting the sinner's sins. They are there, but He's not counting them. Because Jesus has paid for them, and all they have to do is to believe that. And they're gone. So this is what the Bible is saying. Not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Let's go on, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. This is the message. This is the heart. This is the passion of why we tell people about Jesus. Be reconciled to God because God has made the way for you to be reconciled and come out of your orphan status. And come into relationship with God the Father and be restored to your status that God designed for you. Can I hear your amen? All right. So we'll build on that. So Jesus himself is the way to a real relationship with the Father. John chapter 14 verse 6. John 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, this is very, very key. Jesus is saying, I am the, read it, the way. Someone say the way. Now, I want to say something because this is very important. Jesus says, I am the? The way. He says, I am the truth. He says, I am the life. He's saying, by saying he is the way, watch this. This may sound sacrilegious. It is not. It's what he said. He is saying, I am not the destination. I am the way. I am the way. What is the destination? No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus himself is saying, I am not the destination. I am the way to the destination. The destination is the Father. Because in the beginning, what was lost was a relationship with the Father that made you and I orphans. So by sacrificing his life, sharing his blood, and all of that for us, he became the way for us to be reconciled back to the Father. Wow. That's very important. Because many times we, we actually either stop our journey at Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with coming to Jesus. We must come to Jesus. But Jesus is not the destination. We must go from and through Jesus. We're not leaving him behind. We're in him. We're going through Jesus to the Father, a relationship with the Father, and the Holy Spirit has everything to do with that journey. I'm going to break it down. So Jesus says, I am the way. I'm the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So he has already dealt with the sin issue. Someone said the sin issue is settled. Say it again. Say one more time. All right. Not counting our trespasses against us. The sin issue is a non-issue when you come to Christ. There is no barrier now between you and the Father. Not only is the sin 
issue addressed, but he's addressed the guilt and condemnation issue. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God, Jesus Christ, no longer counts you and I guilty because Jesus was pronounced guilty and paid the sentence for our sin. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So someone say, I'm not guilty anymore. Amen. So this is important because we need to know that as much as, as we walk this thing out, there are times when we miss it, there are times when we fail. The Bible says, yes, that does happen. If we confess those sins on the way, He's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so that it becomes a non-issue and we don't get tied up in guilt, in shame, in condemnation. That the sin issue has been paid for. Glory to God. We're, but we're going somewhere with this. He has already provided for the righteousness issue. Not only are my sins forgiven, but you and I are the righteousness of God in Christ. So all these hurdles have been removed now so that we can do what? Go to the Father. Because you cannot have access to the Father if there's sin in the way. We cannot access the Father if there's guilt or condemnation or shame in the way. We cannot go to the Father if we have unrighteousness. And so we stand before the Father, glory to God, in His righteousness, so that when the Father looks at you and me, He sees Jesus. Can I hear you loud? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He sees Jesus. He doesn't see you and I the way we most of the time tend to see ourselves. So, Jesus is the, the way to a real relationship with the Father. And the Holy Spirit helps us develop an intimate relationship with the Father. So, He is our helper. Look at John chapter 14, verse 18. This is powerful. John chapter 14, verse 18. It says, I will not leave you orphans. Now, in the King James, leave it there in the New King James. It says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So Jesus is about to leave the scene. He says, hey, you're not orphans anymore. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send another comforter so that you can develop this relationship now that I've sorted out I'm going to sort out this sin issue. I'm going to go out of the way, get out the way so he can come. And then he will usher you further in this relationship with God. That word, um, a comfort, comforter means, uh, or, or comfortless, it means an orphan or fatherless. So Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you fatherless. I will come to you. How was he going to come to us? Through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ. He was going to come to us and, and the Holy Spirit was going to do this work of developing an intimate relationship now with the Father. Stay with me. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6 and 7. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6 and 7. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying out Abba Father so here we discover that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of his son the spirit of Jesus is the Holy Spirit remember Father Son Holy Spirit they're intertwined they're one they're just manifesting in three persons so the point is that it's the spirit of his son or the spirit of sonship. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of sonship. Someone say sonship. You've got to get this now. It's a spirit of sonship. Okay? Um, therefore, 
you are no longer, verse 7, therefore you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit is the spirit of sonship. Someone say sonship. Now, I want us to put this gender political correctness aside because now we're going to be doing it. The Bible does not take the time to talk about sons and daughters, kings and queens, it, because in the spirit there is no gender. Okay? They're all sons, we're all kings, but for sake of understanding, sometimes we have to break it down so some people don't feel left out to say, well, I'm not a son, I'm a daughter. You know? It's just political correctness. It does not apply to the Bible. It applies to the modern context. So, someone say, I am a son. Okay, why is that important? And I'll tell you why the Bible says you're a son. Because traditionally, sons, number one, become heirs. Daughters don't get the inheritance traditionally sons get the inheritance number two sons carry the DNA of the father and they pass it on biologically genetically that's why the Bible says we are all sons whether you're male or you're female, spiritually, we are sons of God. And then talks about the fact that we are heirs of God through Christ. Okay? Now, so the Holy Spirit is the spirit of sonship and teaches us to relate to our Heavenly Father as sons. As sons. Not as slaves. Not as servants. So you are not a servant of God. Now we use that language partially out of ignorance and partially out of practicality. To say, well, Apostle Gamedze is a servant of God. Well, that's actually a demotion. <laughs> because a servant is inferior to a son. Okay? A son has rights a servant doesn't have. A son has access a servant doesn't have. A son has privileges a servant doesn't have. So that we are not servants. And this is very important. You're not coming here tonight as a servant. You're coming here tonight as a son. In your father's house. About your father's business. You're not a stranger. You're not an outsider. You're not a foreigner. You are a member of the household of God. See, when you are a son in a house, you, you don't carry yourself the same way as a servant. Your child walks wherever they want to go. I mean, unless they have to knock in some private space, it's a bedroom or a bathroom or something. But they're not asking, can I go to the kitchen, please? Can I go to the garage, please? Can I go to the dining room? No, he's like, this is your house. Go to wherever you want to go. And that's the liberty you and I have, glory to God. When it comes to our Father, that's how we can come with boldness we don't come begging. We, don't, we come humbly, yes. But we don't come as servants. We don't come as inferior. We don't come under guilt. We don't come under shame. We don't come as um, unimportant. We are not intruding. We are actually expected and we are welcomed. Glory to God. God will stop his conversation with Michael to talk with you. If he needed to, he doesn't because God is God and so he can do a billion things at the same time. But you understand what I'm saying is that it's not an intrusion for you to come before your father. You're forever welcome. Someone say amen to that. All right. 
So the Holy Spirit stirs, us, stirs up the desire to relate intimately with our Heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit stirs up that desire. Someone was talking today, it was um, Pastor V was sharing about the testimony of the relative that had become alienated from the family and from God. And then there was this encounter. And during that encounter, she began to realize that she was trying to satisfy a hunger in her heart by going here, going there, trying this, experimenting with that, always lead to God. Maybe it's everything, maybe it's everybody, all of those things. Meantime, the motivation was this hunger. What is that hunger? What is that hunger? Because that hunger does not go away because you come to church. That hunger does not go away because you're serving in the house of God. And I'll tell you that hunger does not go away because you're in the ministry either. That hunger does not go away except you recognize what the hunger is. That hunger is for relationship with the Father. That is the craving. That is what we all desire. Is an intimate relationship with the Father. That is the, the thing that motivates us and the Holy Spirit stirs that up to try and draw us closer and closer to an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. And He heals us from our Father issues. The Holy Spirit heals us from our Father issues because our Father issues are a barrier in us having an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. Can I hear your amen? Because once you use the word Father, psychologically it triggers something. Good, bad, or ugly, or indifferent. Depending on your experience and your concept of a father. Now, I'm not speaking down on my culture because I love my people, I love my culture, I'm proud of where I come from. But one thing about the culture that traditionally I would grew up, grew up in as a Swazi, fathers are distant. Emotionally, they are unengaged. Fathers take care of natural things, and, but they're not, there's, there's, there's no concept of, you know, feeling loved by your father. Your mother, yes, but not your father. That's just the environment. Now that could present a father issue. Because when I come to my Father in heaven now, what's going to happen? I'm going to perceive him as somebody distant. The devil won't bother with me. Disengaged. Uninvolved. Uncaring. And that's going to affect my relationship with him. Let alone now if really something bad happened. And there was something that was traumatic that happened. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm talking about father wounds now. Where people have been abandoned by their fathers. Others have been denied by their fathers. Others have been abused by their fathers. And now, when we start using this term father... It triggers something negative. And instead of running to the Father, what do we do? We run from the Father. Because Father does not connotate something positive in our lives. 
And the Holy Spirit heals our father issues. He is able to get in there and heal that brokenness and that hurt. Remove it out of our souls. So that now we are free to approach the Father without anxiety, without fear, without condemnation, without hesitation, all of those things. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And have a relationship with the Father. I've put out a challenge many times to even people in the music ministry, and I've said this. Think about all the songs that we sing in praise, in worship. And think how many of them talk about Jesus. And there's nothing wrong. Think how many of them talk about Jesus. And that's good. We give Him glory. We give Him praise. All right? Now think about how many of them talk about the Holy Spirit. I guarantee you it's about half. I'm not even going to go and talk about how many talk about ourselves. <laughs> and what we are going through and what we want and what we need and all of that. I'm not even going to go there. I don't count those really as, as, as praise and worship. They're just celebration songs. It's fine. But they're not getting us there. Now think about, I say to them, think about how many songs... Talk about the Father, especially in our vernacular. I guarantee you struggle to get five. Once, just two. They talk about the Father. We are comfortable with Jesus. That's fine. But Jesus says, I am the way. We, some of us, and learning to be comfortable with the Holy Spirit. No, no, I'm not sure. It's like, uh, still checking him out. But then many of us struggle to go to the holiest of holies behind the curtain into the inner court where the glory is. And we struggle when it comes to dealing with the Father. And our songs reflect it. Our songs of worship and praise reflect it. And as I say, there's nothing wrong, wrong with the songs that have been written. It's just that there's not enough of them that speak about the Holy Spirit. And there's certainly very few of them that speak about the Father, the Heavenly Father. And yet Jesus came to reconcile us back to the Father, to the Father. So the Holy Spirit heals us from Father issues and delivers us from an orphan spirit and attitude. I have come to realize that so many of our challenges as believers come from an orphan spirit, an orphan mindset. Let me give you an example. Many people struggle in faith, just faith. And I'll tell you why some people struggle seriously to believe God. And I'll tell you why. Because to believe God, you have to trust Him. And we have trust issues. We have trust issues. Because we've been let down, disappointed, whatever, by natural fathers or father figures. And so that problem reflects in our Christian life. Now that person struggles. How can you trust somebody you're not sure loves you? You see the problem. But once you settle the love issue and the trust issue, you know they love you. You know they, 
you can trust them, it's much easier to believe in them. So many believers struggle right there. I'm not even, I don't have to go to many, many places. Just right there. Because of an orphan spirit, they are, they are thinking like an orphan, a fatherless child, abandoned child, a loveless child that has never been loved, never been hugged, never been affirmed, never been uh, all of those things. They struggle. You know, when a person has never received love and uh, you know, you'll find that it's hard for them to even embrace or hug somebody. It's awkward. They don't know how to re relate on that level. Because, and, and this is something that is real, because in our um, uh, African culture, we are generally non-tactile people. In other words, we don't touch a lot. We don't hug a lot. You hardly even see a husband and wife holding hands in the mall. Am I the only one that sees that? We, we, we never grow up that way. We, how do we relate? Praise the Lord. Amen. Nice brief um, handshake over. <laughs> Done. Okay. <laughs> But now to embrace somebody, eh, <laughs> I'm just talking about, you know, a, a proper godly embrace of a brother to a brother, sister to a sister. I'm not introducing any awkwardness here between those are, I understand, okay, that you, there are sensitivities there. But um, the issue is that because we... We, have, we are not used to intimacy or uh, being close emotionally with our fathers. We struggle with worship. We are excellent at praise as African people. Ah, now we can throw down. Ah, ziasu, akona mach. Now we can dance, we can shout, we can... Yeah, but when it comes to worship, we get lost. We don't know what to do with this slow song. It's like, when is the good one coming? Because what it is doing is giving us an opportunity to draw close now and become intimate with God. And because we're not comfortable with becoming intimate... We disconnect and wait for another song. We don't get into it because we don't know what to do with it. Why? Because we have intimacy issues, especially when it comes to the Father. Only the Holy Spirit can help there. And I'm not here to to criticize our fathers, they did the best they could. And they loved us the best way they understood and they did everything and based on what they could. And there's no perfect father, there's no perfect mother. I'm not here to bash anybody. I'm simply here to say that the Holy Spirit delivers us from an orphan spirit and mindset. Someone say, I'm not forgotten. Say it like you believe it. You see, an orphan spirit actually believes they don't matter. They believe that when they pray, it means nothing. Someone else must do the praying that really matters to God because an orphan feels, no one cares about me. So even if I pray, ah, there's no difference. I don't matter to God. I mean, who am I? See, that's an orphan spirit. But a son doesn't have that attitude. 
a son will just pass right through the double doors and say, hey, father, yo, hey, hey, help right here. Yo, stop every, Michael, hold on, hold on, Michael. Okay, archangel, shh, I'm talking now. Dad, this is what's up. <laughs> and it's not rude. I mean, it literally won't do that. But um, I'm just saying that a son doesn't come creeping and, and weeping and, and bowing and scraping in that way. No, we humble ourselves before. What we're actually doing is humbling our flesh. So that our spirit can arise and that we can engage with God as sons and as daughters with rights. Someone say, I'm not forgotten. Someone say, I matter. Now, this is very important that you matter because if I understand that I matter and there's no I can't turn, I've got no lights in my house. My prayer is different to an orphan. Because an orphan will say, Oh God, have you forsaken me? Oh Lord, what am I going to do? Lord, remember me here. I'm dying here. I'm perishing. And the father's like, What? Don't you know I care? You matter. So as a son, you can stand on the word of God and say, Father, you promise in your word to supply all of my needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I am not accusing you because I know you love me. I know you've made provision for me. I know that you care about me, but I'm standing on your word and I'm standing against the enemy right now that's hindering my blessings because I know my blessing is here. And I refuse this situation. I will not be a beggar. No. I'm my father's son. I'm my father's daughter if you're a woman. Say, Lord, I'm my father's daughter. My father cares about me. I refuse to tolerate this in Jesus' name. As a child of God, I stand on the word. As a matter of fact, I command my money to come now. I command these bills to be paid now. I command these lights to be turned on in the name. And that's the last time you turn off my lights, devil. Because you're a son. But God is not going to allow you to suffer and grovel like a pauper, like an abandoned street kid. And we think, and then religion makes it worse. Because somehow religion thinks if I'm dressed in rags, then, man, I'm really holy. What? That's an embarrassment to the Father. I mean, I mean, I cannot have a child starving in my house and there's a fridge full of food and there's pots full of fruit and leftovers and everything. I'm like, that's a shame that my child is starving and the daddy is so wealthy. It's an embarrassment to God. And so we have a boldness now that we would not normally have because we know who we are. Someone say, I know who I am. I'm helping somebody right here because we are breaking the spirit of the orphan in the name of Jesus. It will steal your prayer life. It will silence you before God. When you want to pray, it will crush you. It will beat you down. It will discourage you from praying. If you have an orphan spirit, you, it's, it's a weight that you just cannot carry. And a lot of people are stuck in their Christian life because they're dealing with an orphan spirit. They cannot progress. They can't break through until they break through there. Then other things will start opening up in their lives. I decree that that is your portion in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Because sometimes we think we're okay until the Holy Ghost starts going to work. He says, oh, you really are, huh? Mm-hmm. 
So why did you run away last month? Me, Lord? Yeah, for a month. <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't run away. Yes, you did. You didn't pray the whole month. Why are you running away from me? What do you think I'm going to do to you? Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so we decree that every orphan spirit and attitude breaks tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. I need to hear a louder amen than that. Hallelujah. Because an orphan spirit makes people avoid intimacy with the Father. An orphan spirit does not want to worship. An orphan spirit hates prayer. Absolutely hates it. Because now you're going to deal with him. <laughs> and if I'm running away from him, why would I want to deal with him? Why do you think that most of the time, very few people come to prayer? It's a reflection of their prayer life. They're struggling in prayer. And they don't want to be exposed in a prayer meeting. What's the issue? Father issues. Orphan issues. The devil starts getting busy, beats us over the head. You know, well, you're not worthy and you know who do you think you are and all that and condemns us and makes us feel guilty make well you do this and you've done that and you messed up like this and you compromised there and you how can you even come here with these holy people <laughs> you don't belong there you belong somewhere else See, that's the devil talking but when you know who you are and you know the price that Jesus Christ has paid for you to be forgiven and for you to be made the righteousness of God, you can push right back. And say, you the accuser of the devil? There's therefore now no condemnation to them when Christ Jesus. I am standing in the righteousness of God. I have a right to be in my Father's house. I'm not a stranger. It's even almost a false thing to call people visitors, only in the context of visiting a church. But there are no visitors. There's only family. So the orphan spirit uses God, but does not love God himself. Mm. Can I say that again? The orphan spirit uses God, but does not love God. Just like a child can use their father's money, but does not love the father. Are you with me? Yeah. And many, many times believers whether this fits in your, if you, this fits for you or not, doesn't really, you know, you decide. But many times, I just wonder how the father feels. It's not nice to feel used. Where a person loves what you have for them, but they don't want you. Imagine what their father feels. They want my healing. They want my answers. They want my breakthroughs. They want my provision. But I'm pushed away. They don't want me. And that must change in our lives. Can I hear you? Amen. I've been guilty. Oh, yeah. Sometimes the Holy Spirit has to check me. Say, hey, 
Check yourself. Check yourself. Are you using God? Or do you love Him? How do I know I'm using God? Because the only time I show up is when I need something. And when I'm okay, I'm gone. So that means I'm using. I want my father's pockets. But when I'm okay, bye. Pew. But don't talk again until I'm broke. A dad. Eh. Uh, what does dad do? He, he's like, if this is the only reason you come to me, okay, yeah. But uh, he knows, uh, you're gone. <laughs> you don't really want to talk to me. <laughs> you just want my money. And so many people in the body of Christ are right in that space. It's an orphan spirit. Because an orphan feels there's nothing to benefit in spending time with the Father. That it's a waste of time. And I decree that if that is the case, it ends today. It ends today in Jesus' name. I know God wouldn't give me this message just for academic reasons because we need it. Come on, somebody. We need it. We need it. We struggle here. It didn't, you know, I didn't learn these things overnight. These are things that God has dealt with me about over a number of years, and I'm helping you learn things that took me many years to learn. To say, no, we can't just be after God's hand. We must be after Him. And if he says, if you're after me, I'll give you what's in my hand. Yeah, I know what you need. And so when we're chasing after God, it's not about, I need this and I need that. Look, if you're going to get it off your chest, go ahead, get it off your chest. But it's about, I need you, Father. I want you. Sometimes it's not about coming before God and presenting all our shopping list of prayer items. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And there's place for that. You know, our petitions or intercession, spiritual warfare. There's a place and a time for that. Sometimes we need to do all those things and just seek the God, seek the Lord. Just wait. Just seek God. And say, Father, I'm done now with what I had to say. Now I'm here for you. Can you just talk to me? Can you just reveal yourself to me? Can you just help me, strengthen me? I just need to know you're there. Wow. Now the Father's like, for real? I'm like, yes, Lord, I, I just need you. Now, thank you for the promotion, but the hunger's still there. I got the job and got the car and got a new dress and Got jewelry and got every, but Lord, I, I'm not satisfied. I, it's you. I want, I want, I want more of you. I got the husband. I got the kids. But Lord, I'm not hungry for that. I need those things for this life, but and a, and a blessing to me. But my hunger, Lord, is you, and and I'm stopping everything right now. Hallelujah! And I'm just drawing close to you, Lord. Won't you just wrap me in your arms? Won't you just? Can we just chill right here? Wow! And I'm telling you, He responds. He responds. Sometimes we're so busy with the things of God, we're missing God.
busy for God, like Martha. And Mary was at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus says, she chose the, she chose the better part. I don't know who that's for, but I know it's also for you and me. An orphan spirit feels far from God and yet avoids the presence of God. It's a, what's the word? Oxymoron. We feel far. It's like other people are closer to God than us. And yet we don't want to get close. <laughs> and yet we want to be close. <laughs> and we're caught in this. Do I get close? No. Let me stay right here. If he wants me, he'll find me here. It's like, why are you standing outside the house? You're a son. You're my daughter. Gen. Salapazi. You are so stressed. Don't you know that I am with you? I don't know who that's for. And you think that you're going to carry this whole world on your head. That you must solve every problem by yourself. And I'm here. I'm with you. You are not alone. And sometimes that's all we need to hear. Can I hear you? Amen. And we're good. We're good to go. Because I know the burden you're carrying. I know you're worried about your children. I know you're worried about your marriage. I know you're worried about your husband. I know you're worried about your mother. I know you're concerned about your job. I, I, you got all this weight. Why don't you just give it to me? Come on, sit down, girl. Come on, take a breath. I got this. I am your father. See, we... <sighs> One of the biggest blessings of being a father is to be a hero. To be the one that is able to rise to the occasion and bring the solution to your child. I'll never forget it when our daughter overseas was in serious trouble years ago. Um, family issues. And we had to go there. I knew I had to. I'm a father. She was going to sink and drown with her daughters. All would be lost. And my wife and I went there together. Oh my goodness. When we arrived, the cavalry had arrived. Everything changed. It's such a good feeling. I'll never regret it. To say I was the hero. With my dear wife, we were the heroes to rescue us. Our Father wants to rescue you. But we're so busy holding things for ourselves. We don't want him to hold it. We don't want to let go. We, we want to fix it ourselves. We want to clean it up. God says, I know it's broken. Stop trying to fix it. Give it to me. Lord, I don't know why I went with this man. What was I thinking? And Lord, he just messed up my life. God says, just give the pieces to me. I remember a vision I had years ago. In this vision, I was carrying a very precious crystal vase. Very expensive, clearly. Beautifully crafted crystal vase. And as I was carrying it, I got distracted. And I was distracted, you know, things were happening. The next thing I knew, the vase had dropped and shattered. I had a dilemma. I was like, I can't fix this. Uh -uh. So either I'm going to run away and not go back 
to God who gave me this? Or I'm just not going to go and tell him that I broke it. And I remember that moment in that dilemma, in that dream. It was so real. I decided, you know, I got nowhere to go. I want to go back. And I was just about to tell just Jesus I was talking to. I said, Jesus, I, he said, I know. He didn't even let me finish. And behind his back, he had this, an identical one. He said, be careful next time. That's our father. He doesn't interrogate you. What were you thinking? What are you doing? You know better. Your mother told you. Your father told you. And you just went off and did it anyway. And now you're in a mess. And now you're messed up. And he doesn't do all those things. He says, give it to me. I know what to do with this. I can fix it. I can replace it. I can make it better. I can make it work together for good. But just come home. Come home. Stop wandering like a street girl. Like you got no home. Come. I know what to do. And I love you. And you're still my daughter. You're still my son. I don't know who I'm talking to. Someone say amen. An orphan spirit, and we're going to pray. An orphan spirit causes people to be unbelieving about the love of God. Hmm. This one's deep. We know that God loves us here. But it takes a while for you to know that he loves you here. Are you following what I'm saying? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. And we can know this here intellectually. But do you know it? Do I know it here? When you are in the situation and it's not changing. Jesus loves me, this I know. I'm not forgotten. I'm not abandoned. I'm not forsaken. I am not an orphan. I have a father. He will come through for me. Even if I am lost, he will find me. If I can't find my way back, he will send the Holy Ghost and he will find me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's the God that we serve. He doesn't give up on us. Oh, as a father, you can be tempted to give up. Yeah. But the father in heaven never, 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 never gives up on his children. Never. No matter how far we go. Now, the story of the prodigal son was that the father did not pursue him, and there's a reason for that. But every day he was there looking out for his son. Every day is he coming. I thought I saw him. Sweetheart, come, come, come. Is that him? Oh, no, darling, that's just a cow. Oh, man. And every day he's looking out. Even for the prodigals. Those who need to come back and those that are not saved, those who are backslidden. He's looking out. When are they going to come home? When are you going to come home? When are you going to come home? I'm ready for you. I've got the fatted calf. It's already ready. I'm ready to celebrate you coming home. That is the heart of our Father. He didn't ask him, what were you doing? What are you thinking? I told you. He just celebrated. My son is back home. Oh, thank God for the Father. An orphan spirit has trouble believing the love of God. It is convinced, and I'm going to close with this, and then we're going to start praying. It is convinced that love, blessings, favor, etc., 
must be worked for. Oh, there's a biggie. This is a biggie. Mm, mm, mm. I struggled with this one for many years. Subconsciously, consciously. I struggled. Because I really truly believe that if God's going to bless me, I must deserve it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I must be good enough. I must earn it. Because that's what I saw. That's how I live my life, to earn people's affirmation, appreciation, celebration, all these things. That's what I learned. That people only clap when you do something wonderful. And if you don't do anything wonderful, then nobody's clapping for you until I found out my father claps for me whether I do something wonderful or not. And I got freed. Another degree degrees of freedom. But I got freed from the idea that I must work for the blessing. I must earn the blessing. I must be good enough for God to bless me. And that's not how God works. It's not. It's not. His love is unconditional. Which means that he loves me and you without you doing anything. It's just like being an Amkulu. I love my grandchildren. They don't have to do nothing. <laughs> Just because they're my grandchildren, I love them. And they can, through their tantrums, they can act out. They can, and I love them. Yabatanda. <laughs> Our father is just like that. He loves us even when we are not performing. And sometimes prayer can be a performance. Come on, somebody. Sometimes we are performing. God's like, you don't have to perform. Just pray. Talk to me. It's not a performance. You don't have to impress me. No, we don't have to impress. Am I talking to anybody? I'm trying to talk to somebody this, this evening. Amen. Because this is where the enemy ties us up. You must fast 51 days. Yeah, you must not. Hey, if you break, ah, you must start all over again. Huh? Now, I'm not encouraging disobedience, but the, the equation is wrong. You don't fast for God to do something. You fast to bring your flesh into subjection. So you can be aligned with God and hear God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You fast out of obedience, not because you're buying a blessing. Because hey. that's where believers get offended. Because they're like, just said it was fast, seven days to get a breakthrough. They said, you must give. Nothing happened. I sugar. <laughs> no. We don't do these things to twist God's arm. No. We don't. We don't. I remember one time I was praying years ago and I learned this lesson. I think it was early in the morning and I started dozing. I'm in prayer, right? And I woke up. I was like, sorry, Lord, sorry. <laughs> Lord, you know what? <laughs> you know what the Lord said? He, he laughed. 
He said, you're tired. <laughs> but he was not offended. He said, at least you slept here. <laughs> In my presence, you were trying to pray. It's okay. Go and sleep. You're tired. We'll talk tomorrow. But this God that's got a whip, every now and again, you must, slave driving master, who wants to be close to such? Not me. No, 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 no. And when we have that impression of God, we are the ones who, because we're thinking of, hey, if I go to church, it was on Shia. God says, I've got no whip for you. Jesus was whipped. So you won't be whipped. You'll be accepted and loved. Someone say, God loves me. We cannot struggle and we should not struggle with the grace of God. Everything God does, you need to meditate on this. Everything that God does, he does because he really decided to do it. And he does it by grace. You can't buy it, you can't twist his arm, you can't force him. You're not trying to persuade God. Your problem is not God. Problem is the devil, problem is ourselves, our flesh. Our will, yes, that's where the problems might be, but it's never God. Tell your neighbor, God is not your problem. All right, now we're going to get to pray. I want us to stand together. Oh, yeah, trying together, but we might flow from here. And if, if, if you choose, and I'm doing this so that you don't fall asleep, um, just let the blood circulate a bit. The first thing we're going to do is to forgive every father figure you have had in your life, including your biological father. Are you with me? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to forgive. And you talk to God, your father, and forgive every father figure. Could be an uncle, could be a grandfather, doesn't matter who those father figures were, but we're dealing with the orphan spirit. So begin to talk to God right now. You don't have to lift up your voice and make it loud. This is between you and God. If you want to kneel, you can kneel. I'm going to give you three or four minutes just to talk to God right now. And forgive those father figures. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you right now. And Lord, we don't want any obstacles between us and you as our heavenly Father. So we begin with the natural fathers. Because we cannot reject our natural fathers and love you as our heavenly Father. We cannot hate and hold bitterness against our natural fathers and love you at the same time. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we are asking that you forgive us wherever we have been offended, wherever we've held grudges, unforgiveness, hurts, grievances. Lord God, wherever we've had issues with our father figures, no matter how justified it was, Father, ask for the grace now to forgive. Give us the grace tonight to let it go. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Thank you, Father. I'm going to give you two more minutes to pray. This is so important. The Bible actually says if anyone hates their father or curses their father, they should be stoned to death. That's the path to death, is to hate your father. It destroys lives. It's the first thing we forgive our fathers. And we ask for forgiveness.
could be a pastor, a father figure that hurt you, disappointed you, took advantage of you. Doesn't matter who it is, any father figure. Church hurt, as it's called, maybe legitimately. In Jesus' name, amen. Now ask the Lord to heal you from father wounds. Ask the Lord to heal you from father wounds. Could be the absence of a father, the absence of affirmation, the, whatever it is, there's wounds. Father wounds. He is not there when you needed him. And he could have been there. It wasn't, it was something he chose. And you were wounded. You can spend the rest of your life trying to feel please a father that's not even there. Thank you, Father. Heal us, Lord. Heal us of every father wound. In the name of Jesus. Now, in Jesus' name. Now, I want you to purpose in your mind that you will seek reconciliation, if it's possible, with your natural father and with father figures in your life. And when you do that, I'm talking about practically go there if they're still alive. And you can do it. If they're gone, they're dead, you can't reach them, well, just do it in your heart before God. When you do that, you go and ask for forgiveness. You don't go there to accuse. You don't go there to dig up wounds and issues and open up court cases. You go there to bury it. And say, Father, forgive me. Dad, forgive me. Wherever I was wrong, wherever I disappointed you, wherever I hurt you, wherever I dishonored you, disrespected you, please forgive me. You'll be amazed. There's nothing that's going to melt a father's heart more than that. He'll be the one confessing. So make that a resolution in your mind. Now, the next thing I want us to do is renounce rebellion against authority figures. See, the thing about a father is that he represents authority. And when there are father issues, we have rebellion issues. We have problems listening to somebody in authority over our lives. So we want to repent now from every form of rebellion against any father figure in our lives. Go ahead and talk to the Lord and, and renounce that rebellion. Repent from it in the name of Jesus. Not all rebellion is aggressive. Rebellion is passive rebellion. In other words, you just don't do it. Passive resistance. Passive disobedience. Passive rebellion. No attitude, just I'm not going to do it. And I'm talking about something you should do. It's still rebellion. Father, we, re we repent now. And we renounce every rebellion against any authority figure in our lives, Father God, whether that authority figure is in our family, whether it is a natural father, people over us, a grandmother, an uncle, an aunt, Father God, where we have rebelled, even though we could have followed the path of wisdom, not to compromise your word, but Father God, where we just refused to do what we were told or advised to do. Father, it could be in the church where it was a pastor, Father God, and we rebelled. We turned our back towards the advance, to the advice. And Father, we, we, we renounce that spirit of rebellion tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I wanted to purpose in your mind to believe that Jesus paid full price for your relationship with the Heavenly Father to be restored. You're no longer a stranger. You're no longer a foreigner. You're not a servant. So when you come before God, there's no need to impress Him. There's no need to put on airs 
like it's a show, it's a masquerade. You know what I'm talking about. There's no need to try to impress God. It's okay to come before God and say, Lord, I don't know what to say, but I'm here. And tell Him like it is. Tell Him how you really feel. There are times I come before God and say, Lord, hey, I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm tired. Can you please help me? Can you he, please strengthen me? And he does. Or we come and we're down, we're discouraged. He knows. Just be honest about it. You're not a stranger. You're family. You're a son with an inheritance. And the glory of God is part of your great inheritance. I want to say it again. The glory of God is part of your inheritance. We don't beg for it. It's in the package of what the Father wants you to have to experience the glory of God. Believe that God loves you without doing work for it or deserving it. And recognize and appreciate. I want to go to this and we're going to be moving into another phase. Recognize and appreciate the people God has provided in your life. Because an orphan is not just a person who is fatherless and motherless. An orphan is often brotherless and sisterless. An orphan is a person that feels I'm alone. No one's on my side. No one understands me. No one is with me. And so I want you to encourage you to recognize and appreciate the people God has provided in your life. As a father or mother figures, as brothers and sisters, as friends, God has sent them to walk with you. Look around. These are brothers and sisters whom God has given to you in your journey and often will never want to connect. You want to come in? And they want to leave among the church brethren. They want to come in and they want to leave. Talk to nobody, connect to nobody. Come in and leave. That's an orphan spirit. These are your brothers, these are your sisters. God put them in your life. This is your mother, this is your father. God put us in your life. But an orphan spirit has a problem with that. They're always a stranger. Even in school, they're an outsider. At work, they're an outsider. In the family, they're an outsider. In church, they're an outsider. What's the problem? So we're breaking that tonight in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I want you to go to a brother or a sister. If you're a brother, go to a brother, to a sister, go to a sister. Take them by hand and begin to pray God's blessing upon them and thank God for them. This is an exercise just to break some ice. Hallelujah. Just find a brother. Sister, find a sister. I know couples, you know each other already. <laughs> couples, you know each other already. Find a sister, find a brother. And just tell the Lord and tell him, Father, I thank you for my brother. I thank you for my sister. That this is my sister. I ask you to bless them, Lord. I value others like them. Thank you, Father, for sending them into my life so I can be part of a family. That I'll not be an orphan. I'll not be alone. Thank you, Father, for the body of Christ. Thank you for the church. Thank you, Lord, that you put me in a family. And I'm no longer an orphan in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Lastly, God bless you. Amen. This is so important, beloved. This is so important. I just can't tell you how important this is, but I'm trusting the Holy Spirit that even as we are going through this journey together tonight, God is doing a work. 
on the inside of us. Hallelujah. We, 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 we are working on making this a family. A family where no one goes to bed hungry without a meal. A family where you cannot be without a way to get someone to pray with you at any time. A place where you know you can be yourself. You don't have to put on airs. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to impress nobody. That's what we're working on. And sometimes we miss it. We mess up. We're still family. Someone said we're still family. Hallelujah. We don't have to put on any masks. We don't have to pretend about anything. It's okay to say, I need prayer. It's okay to say, can you please pray for me? I'm really going through right now. This is a family. Hallelujah. That's what we want it to be. Glory to God. And, and brothers and sisters will respond in the way that God helps them. So be seated and I'm going to share these things. Because I want to close here and say we need to learn to relate to God as our Heavenly Father and seek a close relationship with Him. Remember that He is your Father eternally. He's your eternal Father. Okay? It's forever. At the end, we're getting there. We're going to pray for those people who are going out tomorrow. We just some of them are that side, and they'll be joining us from the youth vibe, and we're going to pray with them. Have intimate, ongoing conversations with the Father. Okay, what I mean by that? You can start a conversation with God in the morning and continue it. Okay. Have an open conversation. Keep the line open. Father, as I was saying, now that I have my lunch break, <laughs> as I was saying this morning, <laughs> by the way, thank you for sending an answer this morning. Thank you for the encouragement. You understand what I'm saying? Just try and de-officialize it. Take the starch out of it. Make it an ongoing conversation. Say, Lord, you know, this morning I was asking you for strength, but wow, thank you. I didn't know you'd send it that quickly. I'm talking about conversations with God now. Okay? Um, uh, sometimes saying amen gives the impression that you've stopped praying. And you're not going to talk to God for the rest of the day. No, we need to be having these open conversations with the Lord. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm helping somebody. See yourself as his son that he, you can cast your cares on him. Be quick to repent when you have sinned. Value your relationship with him highly. <laughs> That's one thing I know. When one has sinned, in whatever way, Going to him is <laughs> a struggle. <laughs> hmm? Well, you go and you start praying your regular prayers and it's like, ah, you know what, Lord? <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord. It will be a, a blockage. Just deal with it. Thought I, I shouldn't have had that thought. What was I thinking, Lord? I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. Get it out the way. And, and it's over. You go and talk about other things. Okay? Deal with sin quickly. Don't let it accumulate, you know, and take time because it tends to become a bigger mountain as time goes on. Because now pride gets involved. To say, hey, I haven't said I'm sorry for a week. And now I must humble myself. <laughs> you see, now it's a bigger struggle. And it keeps you from the presence. Okay. 
um, don't be afraid to ask him questions and be practical yeah because we're pressing into the glory guys we're pressing into the glory this orphan thing is one of the biggest hindrances to accessing the glory and we, are deal we have dealt with it and we're dealing with it and God will continue to deal with us in whatever way he needs to can I say you can I hear you aloud amen? amen amen don't be afraid to ask God questions I have asked God questions and I've been amazed how quickly he gave me the answer be honest tell her I don't understand and be honest I don't understand this please explain it to me You'd be amazed. Either he's going to take you to where the answer is and you'll get the answer somewhere or he will explain it to you. It's just that real. Don't be afraid. It's not an inconvenience. He knows you don't understand. So he'll explain it. Oh, the Holy Spirit will teach you. About the smallest thing. I don't understand. Why is it taking so long? Why am I not married? Lord, why, why, why am I struggling about a job? T explain, I don't understand. Why is this blessing delaying, Lord? Uh, don't be You're not putting God in the corner. <laughs> he has the answer. Yeah, he has the answer. And he will answer you. Now, it may not be in that time of prayer, but he will very quickly. The answer will come, but you must be ready for it. Because sometimes the answer is not what we want to hear. But sometimes it is. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Worship and praise Him anytime and all the time. Maintain an attitude of gratitude. Let praise and worship be part of your life. The Bible talks about making melody in your heart to the Lord. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, just for strength today. I was really struggling yesterday. Lord, thank you. Today I'm feeling much better. I'm feeling much stronger. Thank you, Lord. I give you praise and honor and glory. Thank you, Lord, for that provision. Whoa. Thank you, Father, for that blessing. Okay? Worship and praise Him anytime and all the time. And then finally, respond when the Holy Spirit is drawing you to the Father and seek his face when he is drawing you respond respond you know sometimes I purpose to myself that I'm going to wake up at a certain time and pray but sometimes the Lord breaks that protocol and he wakes me up two hours earlier and I'm like God is early <laughs> I don't do that <laughs> well, he woke me up at two instead of four <laughs> <laughs> whatever like okay and the sleep is going and I get up like, okay fine Father I love you I honor you I bless you you know sometimes I'll be honest with you I purpose to wake up at a certain time and I sleep I'm like huh at six I'm supposed to be up at four and I'm like oh now I've got a choice now. Am I going to feel guilty and ashamed about it? Am I going to struggle with that the whole day? What am I going to do? Because if I just gloss over it, I might do this again and get lazy and stop getting up. How many people know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the real things. Yeah. So what do I do? Okay, Lord, I'm up now. I'll pray now. We pray. We talk. See, it's not a religion. It's what? A relationship. Praise the Lord.